So we've talked to some extent about the overall general kind of evidence that features exist and that they're relevant in a variety of languages, uh, namely the fact that uh, while speech is continuous and infinite or infinitely gradient, uh, phonological contrast, lexical items, lexical contrast, these don't seem to be infinite and continuous. They seem to be discrete and categorical. Um, what about evidence for or against particular theories of features and particular features in different languages, for instance? Well, there's also arguments for these particular properties of feature theory. Um, and I'm going to go through two kinds of argument here. Um, but uh, again, this is getting at the question of why are we doing feature theory in the first place? So let me say a word about that first. Um, here's a common reaction to this unit of the class from students, including myself when I started studying phonology. Uh, we already had all these phonetic parameters for describing speech sounds. We spent a couple weeks on this getting a detailed descriptive theory of how consonants and vowels are made using different kinds of articulators. And we had terms like stop or coronal or aspirated or rounded or things like that. And these are describing the properties of speech sounds. But now I'm coming in here and telling you that there's a second way of representing all of the exact same dimensions. So a rounded vowel is going to be plus round and an unrounded one will be minus round. Uh, and it seems like we're just restating everything we did in the first few weeks, except now we're using categorical features uh, that form the basis for lexical representations and for doing phonological operations or constraints or generalizations. So the question is, why do we even need this second way of talking about parameters? Right? Uh, and one kind of argument, as I've been talking about a little bit in the preceding sections here, is that classifying sounds in terms of their features allows us to capture certain generalizations about how phonology works that gradient phonetic parameters wouldn't allow us to capture. Right? So um, first I'm going to give you uh, one kind of argument here that's not quite as important, and then I'll go into the second kind of argument that's really important. So here's a claim from early generative phonology, and this claim may or may not be correct. I bet you could find a language somewhere in the world that looks like it might violate that, but let's assume for the moment that this is the kind of thing we want to account for. Uh, the claim is that no language features a pure vowel height contrast uh, of more than three levels, right? So recall uh, our IPA quadrilateral here, um, and we have all sorts of symbols for representing different heights of vowels. In fact, I think even with the categorical symbols in the IPA, um, we already get at least four heights. Um, and if you want to consider this one to be different, that would be uh, even more than four heights. So you can represent all of these things in the IPA and in physical space, remember this is basically the first formant, this dimension, that can take on an infinite range of uh, frequency values. Um, but there's a claim here that all we have for vowel features in terms of height is a high feature and a low feature. Um, <clears throat> and uh, one of the claims about why we do features that way instead of some other way is that empirically, no language has more than a three-way pure height contrast, right? So languages like English, which basically has all of these, well, sorry, at least has four of these vowels, um, as well as some other ones here, e, i, a, a, a. Um, well, phonetically, there's more than three heights here, but the claim is that in languages with more than three heights, these contrasts are always crossed with some other property, right? So in English, we saw the tense-lax distinction has a number of parameters that coincide with it phonetically. It's not only a height contrast. These lax guys are also uh, shorter, uh, and they have certain other kinds of voice quality properties, or the lack of diphthongization could be another one. In general, these differ not only in height, but also in tense-lax in English. The claim is that for languages that don't have these duration or lax tense distinctions or ATR distinctions or whatever kind of distinctions you want to uh, imagine, for languages that don't have those and only have height, three levels is the maximum. You can only have high, mid, and low. 
That's what our feature theory predicts. How do features predict that, or how do they explain it? Well, we have a plus or minus high feature and a plus or minus low feature. There's three possibilities for vowel height then. You can be plus high, minus low, that would be high vowels. You can be plus low, minus high, that would be low vowels. You can be neither high nor low, minus high, minus low, that's going to be mid vowels. The fourth possibility, plus high, plus low, is physically impossible because it's basically calling for your jaw to be both high and low at the same time. Or you could think of it as calling for the first formant to have a high frequency and a low frequency at the same time, and that's going to be physically impossible. So three is the maximum here. Um, this specific example, you know, it's controversial. I'm sure that there's somewhere out there somebody has found a language that has more than three phonetic heights where it's really hard to think of any other parameter that could explain it beyond a fourth height. Um, but this is the kind of argument that sometimes gets made in support of features. Uh, the idea is that constraints on contrasts across languages are due to universal properties of this universal set of distinctive features, right? So the specific phonetic values for any vowel that you find are going to differ across languages. But the fact that they're all represented by these abstract categorical features, high and low, the claim is that, I said it shouldn't be capitalized, the claim is that this is universal. Now note, when I'm talking about features here uh, without any particular value, I'm using this plus minus notation. So this is telling you that we're talking about the feature high, whether it's plus or minus, talking about the feature low, whether it's plus or minus. You can also just do this by omitting the values. You could just call this high and this low. Uh, you should be familiar with both those notations. Uh, if I only put one symbol here, like plus high, then I'm not talking about the feature in general. I'm talking about a particular value for that feature. This is where we're talking about uh, the feature in general, regardless of its value. Um, so this kind of evidence, there are a lot of claims like this about the maximum number of contrasts and how that relates to distinctive feature theory. Um, and, you know, it's worth knowing about and paying attention to for sure. Um, but there's a second kind of argument that turns out to be, in practical terms, usually more important, and it's going to be probably more relevant to most of the things that we do in this class. And this second type of argument generally involves evidence that's drawn from within a language, not from cross-linguistic comparisons. Uh, the idea is that within a language, features allow us to capture generalizations about natural classes of sounds. And this is going to be one of the three most important concepts from this unit that you'll need to use for the rest of the semester. A natural class is any set of sounds that pattern together in the grammar. Uh, what does that mean? Well, as we've sort of hinted at in the preceding weeks, there are generalizations and constraints and processes that affect sound patterns in a language or pertain to sound patterns in a language. And we think that speakers implicitly know some information about those sound patterns in their mental representations and their mental processing. Uh, and the claim is that uh, those generalizations and constraints and patterns pertain to groups of sounds that share features. That's what a natural class is. So what does it mean for some sounds to pattern together in the grammar? Well, they might all undergo some phonological process together, uh, or they might all uh, pattern together as uh, triggering or causing a phonological rule to apply. Uh, or they might be just a class of sounds about which there exists some generalization that speakers seem to implicitly know in a language. Uh, so we're going to talk, obviously, in great detail about phonological patterns and processes and generalizations uh, for the rest of this semester. And you'll get a clearer idea about what I mean when I'm talking about the patterning of sounds. Uh, but this is how we're going to justify or give evidence for natural classes. Um, and that, in turn, is going to have implications about what the right theory of features is for phonology. This kind of evidence is arguably more important than the cross-linguistic kind that I started with. 
Um, and it's definitely easier to obtain than this cross-linguistic typological kind of argument. To know how many possible levels of vowel height contrast there are in the world's languages, you would have to, at the extreme limit, know everything about every language in the world. Obviously, we don't. Uh, and it's quite hard to even get very broad generalizations. Now, when we've looked at hundreds of languages and we've found that all of them conform to some generalization, we do tend to, at that point, say, well, here's a plausible universal. Let's encode this in the theory uh, because it looks like it holds across uh, a wide variety of languages. But of course, it's much easier to look in detail at a single language and get evidence about which sounds form a coherent group, which, which, which sounds form a natural class in that language. And that's an equally good way to get evidence about features on a language-specific basis. Now, on the universality of features, there's a lot of sort of interesting philosophical and conceptual arguments that come up here. We're not going to focus so much on that this semester, although it will come up. We're going to mainly focus on language-specific patterns and having a workable theory of features that will help us analyze those patterns and not predict unexisting patterns. Right? So what do I mean by generalizations? Well, here's a generalization about English uh, and also lots and lots of other languages, Spanish, Malay, Portuguese, uh, modern standard Arabic, Russian, Japanese, um, not all, every language in this class, but many of them. Low vowels are never rounded. Non-low vowels are rounded if back, unrounded otherwise. Um, so this is a fairly common uh, generalization that occurs in a number of different languages. So let me give uh, the world's most common vowel system uh, by far. Nothing else comes close. This is the most famous uh, or most uh, frequent vowel system that's observed in the world's languages. It's a five vowel system. It looks a lot like most varieties of Spanish. I've put this low vowel as a typewriter A and sort of put it in the middle. Um, and that's because uh, a lot of these languages have an ah sound that's neither fully back nor fully front. Um, and so we often just use this typewriter A symbol as a generic low vowel that doesn't really have any frontness or backness properties. Um, and yeah, so what's in this five vowel system? There's generally some kind of an E, A, a, uh, O, oh, and U in systems like this. Uh, you'll probably recognize that if you're a Spanish speaker. This is basically the Spanish vowel system. It turns out, though, uh, that it's not specific to Spanish. There are dozens and dozens of languages that have been possibly hundreds uh, across the world in every language family, totally unrelated languages, that have systems that look a little bit like this. So, uh, yeah, there's definitely something special about this system that makes it attractive for languages uh, as to why we're not going to get there this semester. But know that this is a very common system. Um, what's going on here, my generalization, uh, is that uh, low vowels are not rounded. And this is going to be true in English as well. So we can add in some English vowels here. Put this guy, put some lax vowels in. The high back rounded lax vowel, some lax vowels here, so on and so forth. Um, this guy is going to be a little bit problematic, um, but so I'm going to put that up here, but know that this is going to be um, an exception we'll have to deal with. And what's going on here? Well, uh, non low vowels are rounded if back and unrounded otherwise. Oh, this guy too, unrounded. So low vowels never round. Uh, Non-low vowels are rounded if back, unrounded otherwise, or unrounded if front. Uh, yeah, although this is also going to need to include sensual vowels. Right? Um, and that's in order to deal with this problematic a uh vowel. In English, this is unrounded. It's often described as back. But if you look at the phonetics, it's little bit more centralized and so we can preserve this generalization or have a coherent generalization about the English vowel system if we assume that this guy is not back but is actually central. So uh, again low vowels are not rounded. 
Non-low vowels are rounded if back, unrounded otherwise. So front or central, they're unrounded. Incidentally, that's also going to be true of schwa. Right? Okay, um, so this is a generalization right, about the vowel systems of not just English, but many, many, many other languages. Um, here's the first part of this generalization as a statement. If you're a low vowel, you can't be rounded. Now, rather than just writing that uh, in English prose, uh, the reason we have feature theory is precisely to express regularities like this in the sound system of a language. Uh, we generally do this using negative constraints, saying what isn't allowed in a language. And this always starts with the linguist's asterisk that says, you can't do that, star or asterisk. Uh, this particular one is going to say, hey, you can't be both a low vowel and rounded. Uh, this is not a universal constraint that holds in every language. There are some languages with low rounded vowels, but it does hold in a wide variety of languages. So we better have a system of representations that allows us to express this constraint. Don't be a low vowel that's also rounded. This is sometimes referred to as a markedness constraint, and it's going to be one of our three most important uh, phonological tools this semester, markedness constraints. Uh, for any particular language, don't have this combination of features. Uh, so yeah, this is, uh, says it's called a markedness constraint, and we also use this terminology to talk about the sounds. We would say that low rounded vowels are marked uh, in any language with this constraint. Um, here's some more constraints for the second part of the generalization. That part was non-low vowels are rounded if they're back and unrounded otherwise. How might we write that? Well, here's an idea. If you have a non-low vowel, and again, we're saying what isn't allowed here. If you're, non, if you're a vowel that's non-low, well, if you're back, you can't be unrounded. star minus low plus back minus round. Uh, and if you're a non-low vowel, so I'm going to get a room here, and you're not back, that is your front or central, um, then you better be uh, unrounded. You can't be rounded. So here's three generalizations. And we can express all of these by grouping together certain groups of vowels using features, right? There's no unified real phonetic explanation of this class of vowels. Uh, and we can't have an IPA character that stands for any of these three vowels. What we can do is say that, well, these vowels share some features. And vowels with these features also have this other feature. Uh, this is also somewhat neutral as to which features come first. So another way of discussing this would be to say, hey, if you're a non-low vowel and you're unrounded, you better not be plus back. Because you're one of these guys, don't be a back vowel. If you're a non-low vowel and you're rounded, on the other hand, you better be plus back. You can't be one of these guys. You better be one of these guys. This is what a natural class is. It's uh, in formal theoretical terms. It's any group of sounds uh, that are exhaustively defined by some language-specific features for any given language. In uh, more conceptual or empirical terms, a natural class is a set of uh, segments or a set of sounds that are subject to a generalization that applies to all of them. That's what a natural class is, and it's one of the most important functions of features in our theory. It's one of our uh, strongest arguments for why we need something like a feature theory. All right, I'm going to go through the rest of the examples in section four in a separate video because this one's getting a bit long. I'll be back with that shortly.